In this video, let's spend a little bit more time talking about some of the things that the, the bigger sort of events that shaped the second half of the 70s um, in uh, the history of, uh, of, of rock music here as we go forward. Um, we're talking about the period between 1975 and 1980. Uh, in the last video, I talked a bit about how FM radio changes over the course of the 1970s and mentioned that, you know, it's FM radio starts from a kind of a free form, you can play anything you want, the disc jockey is in, in, in completely in control of what goes on the air. And it becomes, as FM radio starts to become something that's popular, more and more uh, stations begin to switch to this rock format. It becomes the album-oriented rock format. And as it becomes more popular, there's a possibility that of profits being made, of more and more money being made from advertising. Uh, and so, they, uh, like any radio station, they want to have only songs on the radio that people want to hear, because the worst thing that can happen if you're somebody who runs a radio station is for have, to have somebody dive for that button and change the channel. Because having ears on your station, the more of them you have, a lot gives you the ability to sell that number to your potential advertisers. We have to remember, as we talked about in television in previous lectures in part one of this course, radio, commercial radio is not just radio, it's commercial radio. They're in it to make money. They're in it to sell advertising. They don't make money from giving you the, re the, the music free over the air. And if you like the music and you go off and buy the record or whatever, or download the, the, the file or pay for it on iTunes or some service like that, they don't make any money from that. What they make money from is the advertising. If they can get you listening to music you like, they can sell you advertising. And, so, and the more ears you can get on the station, the more you can charge for advertising. And you can see how there would be a real force on a radio station which is driven by a profit motive, not by a public service motive when it, when it comes to FM rock radio. You can see how there would be a real force on them to try and construct a playlist that kept people listening as much as possible. That, that's, that's the way it worked. And what tends to happen is that you get, uh, as, as the 70s unfold, the disc jockeys end up having less and less say about what goes on the air. They don't, they don't lose all say. There's still, we have, we, even in the late 70s, we have specific disc jockeys in big cities breaking particular bands. Um, the, 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 uh, the cars in Boston, for example, that's a, a story uh, that, that, that is a good reference for that point. But in that, and that's in the late 70s. But still, what you get are program directors beginning to control playlists and consultants who are brought in to tell the program directors what kinds of things they should be programming. All of this leads to a much bigger FM radio business, a much more opportunity to get ears on your music if you're in a band, but it's a little bit smaller hole to get through uh, in terms of uh, being able to get your music to work. And so instead of uh, in the first half of the decade where you had big long tracks, you know, that might go on for eight or nine minutes, you know, now the maximum radio, uh, radio song is about four, maybe five minutes at the outside. So we've kind of moved from AM radio when so in the 60s when these, these songs were between two and two and a half minutes. AM becomes sort of pop radio at the end of the 60s and into the 70s. Rock radio moves to the FM band at the end of the 60s and in the 70s. Rock radio is really FM radio, not so much AM radio, right? FM radio. But by the time it gets to the mid-decade, it looks an awful lot like AM radio from the early 60s in the sense that it's highly formatted. It's almost a kind of a top 40 kind of uh, format. And instead of it being two minutes to two and a half minutes for each song, it's like four to five minutes for each song. A lot of the musicians from the first half of the decade didn't like that so much and there was a lot of push and pull and this kind of thing. Um, so it's important to note that that's a big part of what's happening in the second half of this decade. We talked before also about the the development of concert venues. It's important to, to, to realize that um, as we, as we said in the last video, the, the first tours by groups in the 60s were, I mean, they, they, they were certainly organized, but it wasn't a big concert business. Now you've got people who are in the business of doing nothing but promoting these tours, providing sound systems for these tours, uh, providing lighting systems for these tours. It really becomes a big, being on the road with a band becomes a kind of business you can do full time and make a lot of money. And so this, between the radio and the, the big, the growing live, this creates a lot of opportunity for bands to get out there and play and get their music heard and to, and to sell some product. But the biggest thing, and the thing I really want to focus on in this video, the biggest thing that kind of shapes the second half of the 70s from my point of view is the rise of what we'll call the mega album. 
the mega album um, uh, becomes a, is, it actually comes as a bit of a surprise within the music business. I mean, everybody who owns a record company wants to wants to sell a lot of records. But some of the some of these records that we'll talk about, some of these artists uh, from the second half of the '70s, sold uh, in numbers far beyond the wildest fantasies and dreams of record company owners and uh, and investors. I mean, all of a sudden the thing really explodes uh, in, a, in a fantastic kind of way. Um, and so what I want to do is focus on a few of the artists that sort of got this whole mega album thing going. Um, and, and as I said in the first video, the mega album itself uh, is, is viewed by many people as really sort of having triggered a kind of a dumbing down of rock to try to go for the biggest pop, pop, possible audience. So let's dig into some of these records now. Let's start with Peter Frampton. Most people will, will talk about the Frampton album from 1976 called Frampton Comes Alive as being one of the first big mega albums. And boy, that album sold like crazy. Peter Frampton, a guitarist, vocalist, songwriter, um, had worked with other groups before he went on to a solo career. Humble Pie uh, is the one that, uh, that most people uh, may be familiar with. Uh, the, the album from 1971, Rock and the Fillmore, um, is a, a, a live, a double live album that features uh, um, Steve Marriott, of course, as the, the lead vocalist and rhythm guitarist in Humble Pie, but also Peter Frampton on lead guitar. Uh, Frampton left that group on very good terms with, uh, with, with Steve Marriott and, and did three solo albums in the period between 1972 and 74. Uh, Something's Happening was, was um, the third one uh, and got some radio airplay, but all of a sudden along comes this Frampton Comes Alive album, a live record. We talked before about Kiss, how Kiss's first big album was a live album. Well, here we go with Peter Frampton, but this was a really gargantuan uh, record for him. Um, number one, of course, in 1976 with three big sort of radio hits and chart hits, uh, Show Me the Way, uh, Baby I Love Your Way, and Do You Feel Like We Do. Interesting about Do You Feel Like We Do is that Peter Frampton was the one who became famous for using something that was often called the talk box. The talk box was um, you, you play your guitar and the, the, the signal would go from your amp into a little uh, speaker driver that would be connected to something that looked like sort of, I don't know, like inch wide surgical tubing. And that would come up the microphone and you put that in your mouth, the sound would then, uh, the sound from the guitar would then go into your mouth and you could shape it using your mouth and your lips and the sound would then come out the, um, the microphone. So it would sound like the guitar was actually talking. And so when you listen to that, you'll hear him say, doing the title of the song, Do You Feel Like We Do? And the crowd responding and all that. And boy, that still plays a lot on classic rock radio, but boy, did that tune ever really kind of uh, make him uh, into a star along. I, 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 again, I say with Show Me The Way and Baby I Love Your Way. Well, uh, another big album from that time uh, is the Eagles Hotel California uh, from 1976. Uh, the Eagles, we talked about in the first week of the class as being an important group associated with country rock, but uh, by the time they get to this record, uh, Bernie Lydon, uh, uh, the, guitar, the original guitar player in the group, is out, and Joe Walsh, who had previously been in the James Gang, had a bit of a solo career, came from Cleveland. Um, at least the James Gang came from Cleveland, uh, was into the group. And this Hotel California, what a big album uh, this was for the Eagles. Uh, three, three hits on that, uh, New Kid in Town, the title track, Hotel California, and Life in the Fast Lane. Kind of a concept album about, um, I guess, you know, what, what can happen to you if you sort of get stuck in the California lifestyle, you know, you can check in, but you can never check out kind of thing. Um, if, if you check out the uh, album cover, notice the parallels to the Sgt. Pepper uh, album cover when you open up the gatefold on the inside. It looks very much, it's very much influenced by the, by the Sgt. Pepper cover. Uh, this is not the first concept album we've gotten from the Eagles. Remember in week one, we talked about the album Desperado as being kind of a concept album uh, from that group. But again, um, Hotel California, a big, uh, a big record, and then uh, the long run uh, follows in the late 1970s. Uh, some of the guys who worked on the album say it took so long to uh, record, they like to call it the long one. But anyway, the long run, another big album uh, that really sort of put 
but the eagles into the um, into the category of like mega mega stars, so these these gigantic sales. Uh, but maybe the group that sort of takes the the real prize here for uh, the mega album is Fleetwood Mac. Fleetwood Mac originally starts out as a, a blues band in, in England in the late 1960s. Uh, the Fleetwood Mac comes from Mick Fleetwood, the drummer, and John McVie, the bass player. The early band featured uh, Peter Green on lead guitar. Uh, we talked before about the Peter Green version of Fleetwood Mac having done Black Magic Woman, which later then became a hit for Santana and a very close cover version. Um, at the end of the 60s, the early 70s. That, that group had an instrumental hit, a UK number one instrumental hit in 1968 with Albatross. And then Peter Green leaves the group, Christine McVie uh, comes in, um, then Bob Welch comes in for a period of time in the early 70s. The group has some critical success, but not the kind of success that would await them in the second half of the decade. Welch leaves the band, in, comes, in come a couple of Americans, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks, who had performed together and re released an album together as Buckingham Nicks before this. They come into the group, and in 1975, they released the number one album, Fleetwood Mac. Does pretty good. Has three, uh, three hits on it and gets a lot of FM radio play. Those hits would be Over My Head, Rhiannon, and Say You Love Me. But nothing prepared anybody for what happened after that. In 1977, they released the album Rumors. Not only was it number one, it spent 31 weeks at number one. <laughs> Come on, that's, that's over six months at the, in the top slot uh, of the album, uh, uh, the, the album charts, selling oodles and oodles and oodles of records and making Fleetwood Mac uh, into uh, like the biggest, some of the biggest, maybe one of the biggest acts in the entire entertainment business. Tracks from that Rumors album, Dreams, Go Your Own Way, Don't Stop, all staples of classic rock radio now. But hardly anybody who knows rock music in the 70s doesn't know those Fleetwood, a lot of those Fleetwood Mac tunes from the end of the 1970s. Maybe they hate them, they don't like them because they think they're too sort of soft rock or whatever, but still, it's hard to imagine that they don't know them very well. So when you think about what's happening in this whole idea of the, of the, the, the tremendous expansion of profit in the business. And then you think about these albums uh, from the second half, the beginning of the second half of the 70s, uh, Peter Frampton's Frampton Comes Alive, The Eagles Hotel California, and then Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. You can see how record business people would be just, you know, have their mouths watering for this kind of a mega hit because there was so much money in it. And so the, the criticism would be that this shapes a lot of their thinking. Every band they bring out, they hope, as a Fleetwood has got a rumors in them, you know, a Fleetwood Mac, uh, a big mega album in them. And so the sense is that they're going with, the, it's, a, it's a big lottery, it's a multi-million dollar lottery, and they don't want to invest their money in bands that don't have a chance of winning. <laughs> Everything wants to, because one winner takes care of a lot of losses that you have on the other losers. And so this is the strategy. So let's talk about some of the other bands that, uh, that make up the second half of the 1970s, focusing first on continuities, that is, bands that maintained pretty much the approach they used in the first half of the 1970s. That's next.